this word to him. And how many of you would be getting your house in order if you knew you were going to pass on? I know I would, right? But this isn't his intention. His intention is to write this letter that we're going to read this evening. And what kind of shepherd does that? Let me tell you, the shepherd that is guided and spirit-filled, right? Because his only concern this evening is direct the sheep in the right direction. So as we get the word, the title of this evening's message is the prophetic scripture. And we're going to understand why. Let's go to 2 Peter. And we're going to go ahead and start in verse 12 and read all the way to 21. And then we're going to go back. So give me an amen when you're there. Amen. Excuse me. Chapter 1, verse 12, all the way through 21. I said chapter 2. Chapter 1, verse 12. Let's read. For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you will always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we do not follow cunning devices, fables, when made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitness of his majesty. For we received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophet, excuse me, the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And the church says, Amen. Amen. Let me tell you what Peter is doing here. He's preparing the church for false prophets. And he's preparing the church to be able to understand the power and authority that we have as God's word, his prophetic scripture that he has given to us. I want you to go back to verse 16. And I want to start there. For I love what he says, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables. Underline that word. A lot of scripture tonight and a lot of word. He says, for we do not follow these cunningly devised fables when we make known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. You know what that word cunningly fables means? It means a mystical story. And in those days, those people were telling God's children these fables that were not aligned with what Jesus Christ had did. And it, they were talking about these mythical gods that were not the Lord and Savior that we here this evening worship, right? They were giving them fables. And why? Because they were trying to take the name of Jesus out of everything. It's no different than 2020, church. That's why we are grounded on the word, because we cannot run after fables, stories that do not exist, stories that have no substance. We have to run after the word of God. And this is what Peter is getting ready to do. Even though God spoke to his heart and says, you will be passing on. But see, I love what God does. He never leaves anything unfinished. He goes, you will be passing on, but you've got to continue to prepare my sheep because there are men that will be coming in a false name and not the name of Jesus Christ. So they're chasing after these fables. Catch me on this. And they were talking about little gods and little miracles that were not in line with our Lord and our Savior. See, realizing that these false leaders and their followers would try to discredit this letter that Paul is writing. And it's not any different today how people are trying to discredit our Lord and our Savior. And can I tell you how they're doing it? By causing us to live contrary to the Word of God. 
See, there was a time in Peter's days where they would try to discredit the letter, but we are doing a good job here this evening because we're not running after the word which is holy. See, the devil no longer has to put his hands on us to get us to stumble. We're doing it our own. We're doing it good in our own will, right? He just has to stand back, and he knows that if he can keep you away from the living word of God, what are you going to chase after? Everything other than the word of God. Fables, right? And see, Peter understood this, and he's like, you know what, church, listen. I know they're out there. I know they're trying to discredit this letter. And I know that they are not inspired by the men of God. Of Jesus Christ to you. See, listen in verse 16, underline this word, where he says, It was made known to you. For we do not follow cunningly devised fables. When we made known to you, understand this is a Greek word. It's a very technical word that you got to understand here this evening, church. It is to impart a new revelation. See, right now in this church, the word of God is being made known to you. We are imparting a new revelation. And you know the craziest thing about the word of God, can I tell you? Is when you hear it, you have no excuse not to obey it. See, because when the word of God goes forth, you can fool man or woman and you can say, yeah, you know what, I didn't hear it, but God knows you heard it, but you never received it. So I have made known to you when the word goes forth, he is imparting not only his love, but he is imparting a revelation for your life. See, that's why it is so important to not be hearers only, but to be doers of what we hear. And it's not a fable. It's not something that's a myth. It's what God says in his word. See, to make known is to start to give you a revelation. It's to let you know that God is getting ready to speak to you. And I love this. The word fables in Greek means mythos. M-Y-T-H-O-S, like a myth. And you know what? That's exactly what a fable is. It is a myth. It has no substance and it's not real. And see, the enemy knows that as long as God's word is taken from the church, we are going to chase after fables. We're going to chase after people's interpretation of what we think God is or what we think God wants us to do. How many of you have heard, oh, you know what? Take the world by the tail and live it to the best. Right? We've heard that. Or you know what? Make as much money as you can while you're young. That way you can sit back and retire when you're old. And see, that's, these are these fables. These are these myths that the world teaches us. But let me tell you, it's nothing to do with this world. It is God making known to you what his promise is, what his direction is, and what he wants for you as his child. He wants to impart to you his holy word and his holy scriptures. And that's the only thing that's going to ever release the church from bondage. See, Peter knows this and he's preaching it. So let me tell you, church, don't ever fool yourself. When you hear the word of God, you better take heed to that word because there will be a time where we will come in the presence of God and there is no excuse that you can come up with because he's going to... Bring the time, the date, and the place when he imparted his revelation to your life. And then what are we going to say? Well, I just didn't have time, Lord. And he's not going to take that as an excuse. He's going to say, you know what? You didn't have time because you never made time. Because where your treasures are, there your heart will be. Did you catch that? Where your treasures are, church, is where your heart's going to be. Are you holding on to the things of this world? Are you holding on to what people tell you that Jesus is not coming? That you know what? That's just a myth. I was 18 years old and I was told that Jesus was coming. And I'm 49 now and he hasn't came. But you know what? Look at the scriptures. Look at what the word is making known to the church. What he's imparting to you this evening. He is around the corner. And he's coming for those who call him Lord. Amen. 
for those who call him Savior. Has some of you felt a change in the direction in your walk? Yes. Don't be shy. Raise your hand. You know why that's happening? Because the word is being imparted to your soul and to your spirit. And you're starting to be fed with that which is not a fable, that which is not a myth. But you're being fed by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Yes. See, some people think that the gospel and the biblical record are just an ancient myth. And you know what? It was in the Old Testament, but it's now in the New Testament. We don't take the word seriously. We don't think that God speaks through his word. But not only does he speak through his word, he will judge through his word. Right. And this is what touched me. Peter rightly insisted that his message is not a myth. You know what? History has proven that there are eyewitnesses and testimonies of God's word being prophetic. There are testimonies here in the New Testament that God's word is prophetic. And you know what testimony I'm talking about? Is a changed life. Is a changed life. When you see a Christian who is changing, that is their testimony. And we are the eyewitness to say, man, the Holy Spirit of God is moving upon that person because they're not doing the things they used to do. Their treasures aren't put into this world. Their treasures are in heavenly places and they know that there is a transformation because the word begins to impart Amen. that prophetic scripture that we're talking about. Amen. See, we have to understand right now that the word is the word and it's nothing else but the word of our living Savior. Because with this hand, we can't say we love God. With this hand, we can't say we're in the world. It doesn't work that way no more, church. If we're going to raise this hand and praise God, this hand better be raised up and praising Him both ways. Do you see the direction of the church this evening where they're going? They think that they can praise here and they can live in the world here. And God says the word is not being imparted to you because a person that has a hard heart, all it's going to do is it's going to try to go and it's not going to go anywhere. It's when we open up our hearts and we surrender and we say, God, you know what? I know that you're alive and well. I haven't always been living according to your word, Father God. But now I know, Lord, that you are coming. And I don't want to be those who are left behind. I want to be caught up in the sky of glory and glory. I want to look upon your face. I want to praise holy, holy, holy. I don't want to be stuck on this earth. And those that are stuck on this earth are chasing myths. They're chasing fables. You know how many times a Christian has told me, oh yeah, you know what, God is love. But that's her excuse to say, yeah, God is love. So I can go and continue to do what I want. And there is no just God. He loves me. He loves me and he's allowed me to do these things. He loves you and he's allowed us to do these things. But there'll be a time where he'll call upon his church and he'll look at each and every one of us and say, what did you do with my spirit? What did you do with that word that went forth on Sunday? That word that went forth on Wednesday? What did you do with it? Did it change you? Or did you just think it was a word that was fables? It was a myth. Because those that are living contrary to the word, they believe it's a myth. Because are we to fear our Lord and our Savior? Do we not fear hell? Well, if we fear hell, we wouldn't be living according to what hell says we should be living. We would be doing opposite of what hell says to be doing, right? But look around, church. Look at those that are indoctrinated with the world. And I'm trying to fill Peter right now. Right now, I would be focused on getting ready to die. I'm leaving this earth. Do I got my house in order? But no, his focus is, let me let the people know that God's word is not a myth. That God's word is power. It is authority. It is healing. It is transformation. It is sanctification. It is everything that I died for on the cross so that my children can be raised up and caught up with me in the sky. And they will have eternal life. Yeah. That's seen are you an eyewitness? Because when you become an eyewitness to God, you change. Yes, You're not that old man or woman anymore. You don't have those old desires. You want 
to be a living testimony for those who are perishing, for those who don't know God, for those who have gone astray, for those who have given up on life, for those who have given up on everything. You are the eyewitness to say that the word is alive and the word is well. Amen. That's exactly what we have to do. Because let me give you a scripture. Write it down. 2 Timothy 1.8. 2 Timothy 1.8. And God's always shown me when a prophetic word goes out, the church is always empty. Is that correct? Isn't it crazy? It's like so many things will hinder people from coming to church. And you know what? When you're going through it and you're arguing and you're in a battle and God says it's church time, go there because there is a blessing and a promise for you. Amen. So 1 Timothy I mean, 2 Timothy, I need my glasses. 2 Timothy 1.8, I'm going to read it for you. It says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Are we sharing in those sufferings? See, Timothy's saying, do as I'm doing. Don't be ashamed of God. Share with me in the sufferings because he knew that joy was coming in the morning time, right? right? It was coming. He was suffering, but joy was coming. He was going through the things of life, but joy was coming. He was dealing with the how to issue, but joy was coming. He was dealing with anger, but joy was coming. He was dealing with disbelief, but joy was coming. Right. See, we have to know that in our sufferings, joy is coming. Yeah. Yeah. And if you agree with that, then start living that joy is coming because every suffering is another place for spiritual maturity. Yes. Second Timothy had it right. He said, do not be ashamed, church. Don't be ashamed when your friends look upon you and say you're different. Don't be ashamed when people say you don't do the things you don't have. to them when they begin to perish. The second scripture, and I want you to turn to this one, 1 Timothy 6, 12. 1 I'm going blind and I'm going deaf, so I'll wait for that beautiful amen. amen. That's why I have them turn me up louder because sometimes I can't hear myself preach and I don't know if I'm too loud or too loud. <laughs> so 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of what? Many witnesses. Can I go here before we go back into verse 16? Yeah. What? Yeah. Will you allow me just to go here for a few seconds? And, and it's not beating anyone up. Because you know what? Every time that I hear a bell, you remember that old Christmas movie that another person got accepted into heaven? Yes. He's got his wings, right? Yeah. Well, let me go here and I got to read what I was saying. Oh, the presence of many witnesses. Church, listen to me, please. Please listen to me if I say anything. Who are you witnessing? Listen, and it's not beating you up, it's loving you. Who are you witnessing? And what is your testimony? Because if you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ right now, and I know I'm looking at everyone, you've all confessed at one time, some of you have come up to the altar, you are saved by the blood. So who are you witnessing to? Are you catching me? Because to be a witness and have a testimony, we are to witness that who gave us his prophetic word. He gave up his life. And our Savior, that when you're doing things in this world, who are you witnessing? Who are you representing and what is your testimony? And those who are grounding on the word, who are going forward, sharing the gospel to these many witnesses, the devil wants you to hinder 
your testimony because he knows that if he can get you to step back into the world, you no longer have a testimony. Do you see why we are to be focused on what God says in his word and not worry who's on the right or who's on the left, but to be steadfast in his word, to abide, to remain in it. And don't worry about distractions because there are little eyes that are watching you. There are witnesses that need Jesus. And who are you representing? Amen. Who? That's why Christians, little sheep, you can't have two masters. You can't serve God and serve the world. You have to choose one this day on who you, you cannot serve manna, right? Mammon, but our Lord. And this is what Peter is saying. There are many eyewitnesses. I love what this scripture says. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Does it say on earthly does it say a materialistic life? He says eternal life. And he goes on to say, to which you were also called. So how many of you... Because you know a dangerous Christian is one that straddles the line, church. You know, I told Brother Mike here, leading the men's ministry, overseeing it, I go, you know what? The biggest injustice you can do to our men is not teach them the way that you want to be taught. If you expect your pastor to teach you to be faithful, to be on time, to be a tither, to be obedient, to say what he says and does what he says, right? Then you are to teach those men what you want your pastor to teach you. Yeah. Can I tell you a story? I got ordained. And they threw me out there and says, let them sink or swim. And I looked upon that and I said, you know what? Where is the, the way you want to be taught and the way you want to lead? What happened to me? I didn't have pastors follow up. I didn't have a pastor walking next to me making sure. that I knew the right answers. I didn't know nothing about running a church. I didn't know nothing about a business. I didn't know nothing about financing a, a whatever you call it, tithes at the end of the year, giving people their tithes. I knew nothing other than preaching the word. And I said to myself one day, I was sitting there, I'm like, I never want to teach these men the way that they threw me out to the woods. I said, I require to be taught, to be directed, to give everything because the same way I want is the same way I am to give out. And that's what I told Mike. If you want your men to be faithful, you be faithful. If you want your men to be on time, you be on time. If you want your men to be tithers, you better be a tither. If you want your men to be obedient, you better be obedient. If you want your men to love, and I'm just using you because you're the men's. If you want your men to love, you better be able to love. If you want your men to be men of their word, you better be a man of your word. And the same thing goes to the women. Yes. See, you expect me to give you meat, right? You expect me to be here every Sunday and Wednesday. Come on, man, right? Yes. The same way God expects you to be in this church. Yes. There is no other place that we should be unless you're on vacation. There is no other place you should be because if you're not, your priorities are backwards and you got to go back to saying, is God the head or is he the tail? Because if God is the tail, then there's nothing left because I have taken the place of the headship. See, I tell you, girl, and the ladies now, I tell you, the way you want your sheep to respond is the way that you need to respond to them, right? If your sheep are angry, are you to be angry? No, you're to rise above that. You want to teach them what God's word is imparted to us. To love, right? At all times or sometimes. At all times. And I'm telling you this because the same requirements you have from your church, you do have requirements. You come in here, you want worship. You want the pastor to be prompt. Not going to come in here and sit down here. Church starts at 3.45. The pastor shows in at 4.10. Hey, guys, give me a few. I'm just setting up. What would you do? You probably wouldn't stay in that church, would you? You'd probably find another church. 
So you expect these expectations from the pastor. God expects them from you. See, it, it, it's a two-way street. And in verse 16, he goes on to say, I witness of what? His majesty. Let's read it again. He says in verse 16, For we do not follow cunningly devised fables when, when we make known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of what? Of his majesty. Do you believe God is holy? Do you believe that when you came to Christ, he made you holy? Then what's your excuse? What's your excuse? If you believe God is holy and he made you holy, then what's your excuse? Oh, pastor, I'm just going through it. We all go through it. You know how many times pastors want to quit? The same way as you guys want to quit, right? See, I got a pastor in here. He knows what I'm talking about. There are times where I'm like, Lord, is it worth it? But then you do a service and one person comes up and surrenders their life and you're like, yes, it's worth it. Thank you, Jesus, that I didn't quit. Thank you, Lord, that even though this ugly flesh, because this flesh is ugly, wanted everything inside of me to say, call it quits. You know, it is so easy for you to go to a church and sit under a pastor where you just hear the word and you leave. There is no commitment. There is no dedication. There is no obedience. You come, you sit, you hear, and you leave. And that's what the devil wants. See, that's why I read this to you. We are eyewitnesses of his majesty. Catch this. How many of you know about the transfiguration on the mountain of Jesus? You know what that was? Can I tell you, B? It was the showing of his glory. The unveiling of God's glory. And the same glory that happened to him on the Mount of Transfiguration can happen to you. Thank you, dude. But who and what are you serving? Are we serving our children? Because we will be accountable for serving our children. Because we're saying that our children are our wives, that my wife or my children are above you, God. And guess what? When we get to heaven, there is no children, there is no wife, there is no husband, there is no uncle. It's just us and God. What? And we will have recognition, but I know that God will take away all the memories because why would God put us in heaven and keep, give us the same memories of this horrible life here on earth? Who are you serving? Who are you witnessing to? Well, I love my children, but loving your children is not going to get you in heaven because if you ain't loving God first, it's going to take you somewhere else. His majesty, the transfiguration of our Lord and our Savior, he began to unveil his glory. And the glory that he unveiled, he imparted to you. All you have to do is say, I receive it. I will follow wherever you tell me to go. See, that's his glory and it's going to get a little bit better because listen, they got a glimpse of God's glory. He unveiled the final revelation, the apocalypse of Christ. Go to Revelations chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Revelations 1, verse 1 to 3. And the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angels to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is what church? Amen. The time is near. Amen. Blessed are those who keep the word. Blessed are those who are focused on what God and what God is speaking to the church and the direction God is telling you to go. It doesn't say blessed are your children because you were a good mom or you were a good dad. Blessed is your wife because you were a good husband. Blessed is your uh, husband because you were a good wife. It says blessed are those who hear the word of God and begin to follow his revelation. Yes. Amen. Amen. 
Blessed are those, church. See, this is why in the end times, these little churches are rising up and they're not very popular. You know, some of these little churches, can I be honest with you? Their faith is on God and not on man. You, you know what I mean by that? I don't want to lose you because other churches rely on men to be able to keep the lights on, to be able to give, to be able to have these things. But the little churches that are focused on bringing revival, the revelation of God's word to his children, they're not worried about the finances. They're not worried about the lights because they know that God has put them there and they know that God will bring them to the point where they will be and they will be successful in where God has them. It might not be the best building. It might not have refrigerated air. It might not have big screens. But what it does have is a revelation of God's word, which is imparting to you to reveal his glory into your life. Yes. See, when you start to think the way these little churches do, and I know a lot of pastors that run little churches, their focus is on, oh, we need more people. Because the more people we get, the more money that comes in. They're like, Lord, the people that we have, bring them to the altar. Let them know that they have a purpose. Let them know that you die so that they can have breath. Lord, bring them so that they can have revival. See, when we start thinking about money, then our focus is not on what the Holy Spirit wants to do. We're worried about our building. We're worried about light. And God says, that's exactly how the enemy has infiltrated the church. Worry about the sheep and where they're going. Yeah. Yeah. So if you start to think that way, then what do you have to worry about? Well, the bills didn't get paid this week. Well, praise be to God, you're alive to see that the bills didn't get paid this week, right? You could be six feet under and not even know the bill came that it was overdue. Now, I'm just being funny, but when you walk to the mailbox, you have to be alive to walk to the mailbox, right? To be able to look at that bill says it's overdue. You know how many people that are in the grave would wish that they have that opportunity? See, when we put our faith in God, nothing really else matters. Because we know that God will bring us to the point of eventually allowing these trials to begin to perfect us. See, it looks bleak and dark, the enemy says. Man, why do you serve this God who continues to have you suffer? Man, you're in darkness and you have a flashlight with no batteries. You can't even see what's a foot in front of you. Why do you serve this God? Because he knows that if you stay in that trial and in that situation, God begins to mold you. He begins to move you. You begin to rely on him. Your faith is only focused on him. And then before you know it, there is no trial. There is spiritual maturity. And you begin to put everything that you have, every part of you from the head to the bottom of the soles of your feet. And you begin to entrust him with who you are. I'm going in a whole different direction. I don't know why. But the church needs to hear this. Amen. Guys, is there anything I worry about? No. I used to be one of those worry where it's, oh Lord, am I going to live to see my 50s? Well, it's not in my hands if I'm going to live to see my 50s. What I want to live to is what I'm going to do now. How am I going to be able to be more faithful now? How can I let people know that Jesus loves them now? But some of us are so sticklers. You know what the word stickler means? Stick by the rules. That you have the year 2026 already planned out in your calendar. I met people like that, man. They have everything planned out. And I'm like, today or tomorrow is not promised to no man. What are you doing now? How are you being an eyewitness to those who are new to the faith now? Are you one of those Christians that don't let a person leave because you want them to know that you love them? And not only do you love them, Jesus loves them. They're like, how do I know Jesus loves them? Because he's loving you through me. Right? See, I told my brother, man, I'm not picking on him because he's got a big ministry and he's got some big shoes to fill and they're not mine, they're Jesus's. Because Jesus knows that when the men begin to rise up and the men begin to take back what the enemy has taken to them, all hell is going to be shaking in their shoes. 
So guess what? He's got a big thing. You know what his job is to do? Be the first one before that man hits that door, man. Put it in high, pop that wheelie, right, brother? And head out to the door. Say, hey, don't leave, brother. Don't leave. What's your name, man? Sam. Well, Sam, let me tell you that Jesus loves you. Let me tell you that ancient of days, we have a man ministry. Let me tell you that it's on Monday. It's at 7 o'clock. And we want to see you there. And I will keep praying for you that you keep coming back. You know what? But no, we can't let them leave. And the same ones that are new to this church, don't let them leave without letting them see the love of Christ through you. Yeah. That's right? Right? Then yep. you should be hightailing it to that door. You know what my pastor used to do? He'd be the first one. They would close and they would have a song to give him time to run to the door. And he would be by that door and he'd be like, how you doing? Big strong man, Pastor Rob. How you doing? Good to see you. Squeeze the heck out of your hand. And the ladies is like, nice to see you, man. And I remember every time I couldn't beat him to the door. I just wanted to hit that door and leave. He was always at the door and he made sure he looked me in my eye and said, thank you for coming. Remember? But now we have pastors that after the message is done, I'm gone. They go to little rooms and they sit there because there's clicks going on and the upper ones get to go to those little rooms with the little sheep that came in that heard the word of God. Maybe they gave their life to the first time. You know what the pastor do? Oh, I got Sylvia, Gina, and Gina to do that stuff. Go greet them. Yeah. Yeah. Go tell them, praise be to God, you guys say, I gotta leave. Yeah. You see how the enemy is coming to the church? Yeah. I'm not putting anybody down. I'm just telling you that, guys, we are how to a higher standard of who we are in this walk that we call Christianity. See, listen to this. See, in verse 17, let's go there on 2 Peter. Verse 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Can you imagine? Let, let, let me use you, Sylvia, because I know you won't get mad at me. Can you imagine being a disciple? And this loud, thunderous voice, Pastor Pat, came down and said, this is my son who I am well pleased. Can you imagine what the disciples got to witness? It's no different. We have that same witness now. We just got to get into the presence of God. We have to surrender. We have to die to the flesh because we can hear the voice. We can be in the presence of glory. And I know I'm getting wild. And I know I'm getting loud. And people say I get angry. It's not about being angry. It's about letting you know that you have the presence to be in his glory. You get to share in his wealth. And you get to hear that voice that said, this is my son yeah. in whom I am well pleased. Yeah. I watch videos of me on YouTube and it looks like I'm angry. I always watch it. I'm my, I'm my worst critic. But it's not angry. It's if I can't be excited for God, then I have no business here. Right? Come on, let, let me yeah. preach a little bit. Today, we're reading our first Peter. Chapter 2, verse 1. This is what the Lord said. Come on. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus broke the mold of being normal. He went to places that even the Pharisees would not go to. And he didn't need a microphone. He didn't need a large crowd. All he knew is he had the backing from his Father, which is in heaven. And I don't care how loud Jesus gets. The word says he walked into the temple and they were making it a den of thieves. And Jesus didn't come in and say, excuse me, can you please stop what you're doing? It's very offensive to me. He went in there and he grabbed tables and he threw them over. I could just imagine him grabbing those men with those carpenter hands and saying, get out of here. Depart from me. You are not going to make my father's home a den of thieves. But we're allowing Satan to make this temple a den of thieves. Right? Yes. Give me some kind of reaction. Yeah. Smile. Throw something at me. Throw me a tongue or something. Because I'm telling you. Did you just not catch that? 
We're allowing the devil to make this temple a den of thieves when God says that's not what it was created for. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have a, yes. an yes. erupt. Yeah. My veins are going to pop. My eyes are going to turn red. Because you know what? I don't know if you realize how the spirit is moving now. He's confirming to the church there is something different. There is glory awaiting your transformation. Jesus went to the mountain to be transformed. Now you need to come to the cross to receive the same transformation. Help me, Lord. See, it must be noted that Jesus' earthly ministry was to what? To heal, to teach, and to gather souls to his kingdom. Right? Yeah. You know what the church is today? Bless you. Go, hear a message, go back home, and do nothing with that message. Why do people, why are people afraid to invite other people to church? Can I tell you why? Rejection. Rejection. If God tells you, I love when you sit in the front because I use an example. If God tells you to minister to somebody, most people don't minister to, you know why? Because they're afraid that when they approach that person and you say, can I pray for you? They're going to say, no. Get away from me, you weirdo. And we see that as rejection. But no, God says that is obedience. Because even though they didn't receive you, they are not receiving me. But you did what I told you to do. You extended yourself to offer prayer. I'm not rejected in anything that I do. Who rejects me? I am my first, my best rejection. Because I go further away from the word of God rather than coming closer to him. The devil doesn't have to get us to reject God. We do a good job of doing it ourselves. You know, I'm going to go a little bit further, but there is a time that we are in right now. Can, can I be honest with you guys? It's called lazy Christianity. You know, the craziest thing is, I am so excited, my brother is watching tonight. And I wasn't proud of what I did with my brother. We, we were running the streets as gang members. And this guy's six, seven, probably now, forgive me if I'm wrong, 390 pounds. And back then, he was Mr. Olympia, man. His arms were my whole body. I was a skinny guy back then, 130 pounds. His arm was my whole body. And he reached out to me and he says, Man, I'm moving back to Albuquerque. I said, praise be to God. He goes, and I'm going to your church. Amen. He goes, because I need the same fellowship that God has given you. And you know what? In other words, if God can make you a pastor, there's hope for me. He's coming September 3rd back to Albuquerque. You get to meet him. I just told him not to tell you guys stories. And you know the person he says, does your, does your kids know who you used to be, what you used to do? I'm like, no, I don't tell them. I mean, and he's excited. So I went to his page, and I'm not stalking you, brother. You know how it is. And on his page, all on one of his pages were all our messages. Even when we were in COVID, live streaming. You tell me we're not being an eyewitness to those. You tell me that if we gave up, that that might be possible. We are not to give up, church. We are not to surrender our rights anymore. We will fight for our rights when the government tries to take them, right? Yes. But what about the enemy taking them right in front of our yes. face? Right. Come on, yeah. Come on. That's right. No Democrat, Republican, conservative. I'm not talking about a affiliation. I'm talking about your rights that were blood state were given to you by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. And they were given to you so that you would have victory. But we're surrendering them right in front of our faces, the enemy is taking them. And how is he taking them? Through lazy Christianity. Yep. Yep. You will never have a man's ministry if you're lazy, right? You will never have a woman's ministry if you're lazy, right? You will never have abundance if you're stingy, right? We are to say, Lord, this doesn't belong to me. What does belong to me is this temple that I sit in and that I reside in. Come on. And he says, you know what, I'm going because I want the fellowship. You see, one person can change the status quo. Amen. God is waiting for you to change. But before you can change others, you have to change yourself from the moment. Yes. It's okay to be lazy. I was lazy. 
I'm going to put your hands up. It's okay to be stingy. I was stingy and I'll put a leg in. I was very stingy when it came to the church. I was very, oh, don't get me involved, man. I don't want to do anything that the church has to do. I just want to come, sit there, don't be bothered, and then leave. And it was me. But I'm not that way anymore because, you know, I drive my wife crazy. The church opens up at 3.45. I'm leaving the house at 12.30 to get here. Where are you going? There's nobody there. It doesn't matter. I want to be there. Because I want to be an example to say, hey, your pastor's there way before. And we used to have people that lived five minutes away that couldn't even make church on time. Right? We're not back in the old west where you had to ride a horse and a buggy. Man, some of you got V8s, V12s, V4s, V6s with turbo, no twin, whatever, and you can't get to church on time. Some of you have a flat tire, you're like, oh, it's time to miss church. Hallelujah, Triple A, it's right there on the side of 57th Street. Uh, whatever that place is called, what do you call those cars that you ride up? Uber. Triple A, it's on 57th Street. I'll leave the keys under the mat. I'm taking an Uber because I ain't missing church. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because my healing ain't in that tire. Yeah, and the word ain't going to come from that tire because if that tire speaks to you, rebuke it yeah. in the name of Jesus. Yeah. My healing comes to being in fellowship according to God's precepts Amen. with my brothers, with my sisters. Yeah. That's where my healing comes from. Yeah. I got some few more minutes, right? Amen. Yep. Amen. Amen. Well, I said amen. Listen to this. Well, you know what? I want to. But I don't think some of you will come back. Listen. He came to heal, to teach, to gather souls. It was a preview. Mike, this is for you, my brother. It was a preview of the character of God in this kingdom that we call earth. It was God's character. He established the status quo. I'm not picking on him. I don't think I'm picking on him because you know what? He's got a very tough ministry. Yes. And God told me and told Sylvia and told my wife, step back. I'm not going to let him sink or swim. I'm going to be there to guide him and direct him. And he ain't always going to be, oh, brother, give me a hug. Hallelujah. It's going to be, hey, brother, I didn't see you. Where were you? I'm just using you here. I didn't see you, brother. Where were you? No call, no show. Would you like your men to do that? I did it to you, right, Sylvia? She's the administrator, and I said, hey, excuse me, you're late. Well, Pastor, I was just, you're late. Haven't I done that a few times? Because we were trying to establish a godly character. Yeah. Because when she begins to lead this church, people can't say, you're not a woman of your character. They might say, you're mean. <laughs> ah, man, I don't want to be around her. But you know what, guys? If God puts someone in a position, are we to obey them? Yes. Because the Bible says, David even said, do not come against God's anointing. That's right. Right? Some of you, I know that there's days you like me, there's days that I get on your nerves, there's days that I joke too much. My wife just tell me, joke too much, be quiet. But that's my character. As long as I'm not joking sinfully, right? But I talk a lot, I joke a lot. I know I get on my mom and my mother in law's nerves all the time, and sometimes I do it intentionally. But they don't know that I'm building their faith. Because the more that they begin to love me as I'm getting on their nerves, the stronger they become spiritually, right? Right? Can I get an amen from the two matriarchs back there? No. <laughs> See? A lot of work in progress, right? But I'm just telling you guys, listen here. What Peter is telling the church, and I'm going to get to this one because i got to get here. He's saying, guys, you are to be soul gatherers. Yep. Peter reminds his readers that the transfiguration that beheld Christ, dynamic power and majestic coming. The word coming in Greek is parousia. Parousia, which means the glory of his appearing. Ooh, come on, church. Somebody give me an amen. Parousia. Can I tell you something? He is here right now. But some of us are too spiritually blind to see the glory. Can I tell you why we're blind? Because we're letting the world control a temple that it never died for, that it has no dominion over, that Christ gave you the same power and majesty at the mount that he received. You are to receive it here in this church today, right now. Parousia, there's a coming, right? Right now there's a coming. I don't know if 
you feel it, but I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you know what's so good about the Holy Spirit? Let me use you because I'll pick up one on the side. He starts to gravitate. And sometimes when he starts to pull you, it's not comfortable. Can I be honest with you? It's a breaking feeling. It's like somebody doing this all the time. I did that to you because I don't even want me. And anyways, doing that all the time eventually gets annoying, right? Yes. And we say, oh, I'm not going back there because all they do is make me feel bad. God's saying that's not about making you feel bad. It's about making you good. Because you have to understand that there is bad that I need to release so that the good can come in and set you free. So the Spirit, I know, you know what I know the Spirit is when He convicts me. How many of you can say, come make me, Holy Spirit? Yeah, I couldn't at a time. I hated conviction. I'd walk into the church and He was always talking about men. I remember this crazy time that I had. I put yellow streaks in my hair. I was in the MC Hammer parachute pound stage, right? I went through all this stuff. I had the lightning bolts in my head and I had the orange uh, dye in my hair. Those parachutes that you would roll up, right? And we would shave our ankles because we had rolled it. You know what I'm talking about. Those ugly shoes that they call boats, loafers. You remember those, bugle boys? And I walked into church just feeling as good as I can do. I sit down and I remember Pastor Rock talking about men. And he goes, you know what? He didn't even see me because I used to always stay way in the corner. Because once he said in closing, I was gone. And he said, some of you men in here, when are you going to be mad? And I go, oh, here we go. And I bet there's some people in there who have these little lines in their head and these little dye in their hair and they walk in with these baggy pants. And he's talking about me. <laughs> he's talking about me. And see, this is the days of Beritz and all those days when they had MC Hammer, uh, all this craziness, raw bass, DJ Easy Rock, all this music was out there, right? And I was getting ready to leave that night to go hit a club because it was the night that they played that music. And I'm like, he's talking about me. And I started to go like this. And I know some of you are talking about how my wife is dressing me these days, but that's okay. You know what I mean? I like holes in my pants. I'm trying to tie you, buy me a new pair, right? So anyways, I'm like, he's talking about me. I look around and nobody's dressed like I am. I look around, you ain't got blonde streaks in your hair. You ain't got lined hair. And he's talking about me. I was the only one like that in there. And I didn't want to go back. I'm like, who does he think he is? But little do I know what I know now. I wish I would have learned then. Instead of being offended, I should have gone to the cross. Some of you need to run to the cross. Some of you get offended. Can I tell you something? God gave me the opposite of me, and I thank God. She is the opposite of me. I joke. I laugh too much. Sometimes I look at her, and I know that look. Because when she's focused on something, don't bother. Because she'll hurt your feelings. She don't mean to. You know, she will. She don't mean to. She, she loves you guys because she loves Jesus. But there'll be times I'll be like, oh, I'm busy right now. And some of you guys will get your feelings hurt. But when we walk closer to God, we begin to know that God created you differently. Yep. You have a different personality. You have a different personality. You have a different personality. You have a different personality, right? But can you imagine, instead of getting offended, we blend? Pastor Pat's, wow, he can do stuff with his hands, man. He hangs from ceilings and stuff like that. And I always want to help him when we were hanging this. He did all this. And I wanted to help him. He's like, no, I got this. But he would always throw down a sharp knife at me and say, here, put this away. And he's like, I got this. But see, you brought someone in here who's an administrator. I'll teach you well. Okay, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. You know what Pastor Pat could tell him? Can you just be quiet? I'm going to hang it the way I want. But he never did. He says, okay, you want more this way? He went more this way. See, God used his talent and used my skills. And guess what? Because we came together as a team. Look. Look. See those folds over your head? He made those. And I close with this. There was a pole over there that was more crooked than, than some of our government officials. It was like this. And I was hanging with bailing wire and electrical tape. I don't know. I was hanging up there. And I call Pastor Pat, he's slick. You don't ever know when he's in here, but you can always see his work. You don't ever know when Jesus is moving, but you can see his work. Yeah. 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 You don't ever know when Jesus is 
movie. So do you want to hinder the movement of what Jesus is doing or do you want to see his work? Right now there's an opportunity for some of you. And let's be honest with this. I love you guys are new Christians, man. You're getting better. And I love this. We need to represent the new people in this church. Amen. And guess what? If we're lazy, I'll be the first one to put my hand up. I'm not lazy, but I'll put it. If you're lazy in your walk, let's change it. That's right. If you're stingy in your walk, let's change it. Right. If you're not getting involved in your church, let's change it. That's right. If you're not loving those who are not capable of being loved, let's change it. If you're easily offended, rather than pointing fingers at them, go to the cross and say, God, what is in so deep inside of me that I am taking offense to? Because there are so many times that Jesus could have rebuked almost every disciple because they got on his nerves, but he continued to lead right by example. You will get men. I led men in ministry. You will get men that will never let you get in the word edgewise. I remember I had a man that no matter what I would say, I would begin to speak and he'd finish my, my sentence. Or I was preaching on something, he cut me off and he finished it for me. And I'm sitting there like, Lord, just remove him. And God says, no, I brought him here for a reason. Yeah. Well, what's your reason, God? Because he's getting on my nerves. Number one, to build your faith. Yeah. Number two, to build your patience. Yeah. And then number three, to show him the right way to do things. Yeah. You know why there's no respect for authority in our youth today? Because the adults are taking a place. We let our kids do whatever we want. Here's where I close, I promise. We let our kids do whatever they want. We let them go out there and continue to fall flat on their face, but we never hold them accountable for anything. We enable them. I'm guilty. I used to take my daughter in there at four years old and she say, spank her. And she'd look up at me with those big old brown eyes and I'd mouth and I'd say, shh. And I'd hit the bed with the belt, cry, cry. Well, little did I know I wasn't teaching her. I was enabling her. Yeah. Guys, if you are a Christian and you've tasted the glory of God, how are your children ever going to change if they don't see a change in you? Yeah. You know, I had uncles that would go out and buy me beer, and now parents go out and party with their kids. Yeah. I don't know where I'm going. I'm cozy. We have kids. That their kids say, oh, you're my best friend. No, I'm not your best friend. I am your mom. I am your dad. And you ain't going with me to no party or I ain't drinking with you. And by the way, if you're living with me for my house, we will serve the Lord. So take that venom out of here. But we don't do that no more. We party with them. We hang out with them. You know, every time they make a mistake or they end up somewhere, we're like, okay, it's okay. He thought I love you. There's got to be a time where you look at them in the face, right? And you say, you know what? No more. Yeah. If you're under my roof, I'm using this example. If you're under my roof and you keep doing this, you better find Chris good. I'm looking at you, right? Certainly, right? Do you see me wavering? Do you see me enabling you? See that part? You do it again, you better find a place to live, but we don't. We're like, it's okay, Heath, and then eventually we get a call in the middle of the night, they're dead. They hit another car, they were drunk driving, and they're dead. Do you want that burden upon your shoulders? I don't. You know what I want upon my shoulders right now is to know that, yes, I wasn't a good parent all the time. But we can't be living in our faults in the past, and that's why we never grow in the present. If you made mistakes in the past, we have an opportunity to say, God, those mistakes are gone because I have come to you. Take them from me. But you know what? The devil keeps us with our head down. We walk around and any time a subject comes up, we like curl down because we don't want to hear it because we know that we were guilty of that. I know I'm not guilty of nothing because the blood has washed me clean. The blood has forgiven me of what I have given God to forgive me. So now listen before worship. I want to do this worship song right, but I want you to understand something. If there's something you have to surrender, let's get it right before the song goes on because that's worship by God in spirit and in truth and purity with no holes barred, with no condemnation because our God does not condemn, him, condemn us. He releases us, those who ask him. 
Did I do things in the past? Yes, all kinds of bad things. And that brother that's watching me, he knows because I did it with him. But it doesn't label me no more. You know what it's done to me? It's given me a testimony of what God has freed me from. Right. Some of your hands are back. I'm not going to have you come up, but I will have you do this. I want to see your hands because I want to pray for you. But I will challenge you. After you release whatever's inside of you, you don't have to call it out. God already knows, but you have to acknowledge. You know why the pastor tells you to acknowledge? Because it's easy to just to sit there and be no accountability to anyone. But when the pastor speaks in the presence of the Holy Spirit and he says, that's you, and you raise your hand, you know what you've just done to God? Say, Lord, I confess. Nobody needs to know what I'm confessing. You already know what I confess because as this song goes forward, I want to worship you in your glory, in your holiness. How many of you want to worry anymore? I don't. How many of you want to wake up every morning wondering if you're going to get COVID? I don't. You know what I want to wake up every morning saying, Lord, how can I please you? Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you, is that any of you? I just want to see your hands. I'm not calling you up. One, two, three, four, five, six. So all you guys don't have problems that you don't go back to? You haven't released anything that you go back to? There's nothing hindering you in your walk? Maybe it was something, a mistake that you made in your past, but it continues to raise its ugly head. If that's you, I'm going to pray for you. Because let me tell you something. This is where Jesus began to love us. He doesn't want to condemn you. There is no condemnation in Christ. This is what? He doesn't want to condemn you. You know what he wants to do? He wants to embrace you. He wants to hold you right close to him. Because you know why? He knows that he's birthing something inside of you, my brother. He wants to let you know that every part of you was created for a purpose. You, my sister, I see a beautiful smile. It's transformation in the making. I want to be part of that. When you smile, I want to know that I've been part of that. I want to be part of that because guess what? We're going to be hanging out in heaven. You might have a bigger house, but that's okay because I'm going to go visit. Right? Right? If you got a bigger kingdom than I do, they probably invite me over for dinner or whatever there is in heaven because I want to go visit. Because I know that your walls in gold, I got to take part of. So let's close. Father God, as we get ready to worship you right now, Lord, Lord, as you've heard, Father God, the laziness, you've heard the complacency, you've heard the stinginess, you've heard of uh, serving two masters, Lord. You know, Father God, that the enemy keeps bringing up things in our past, Lord. And they're not triggered until somebody mentions something specific to that, Lord. But I, I surrender here. Right now, I surrender to you. Because I know there is no condemnation in Christ. And Lord, because I have raised my hand, I have made a proclamation, Lord, that that is me. I need you. I love you. I want you, Father God. And right now, Lord, release me and set the captive free. Because, Lord, as I get ready to worship, Lord, there is a beautiful altar here. And I love when your children come up to pray. I love when they kneel in your presence because it's a form of humbleness. It's a form of saying, you know what, I am nothing without you, God. You are my everything. You are my all. You are every part of me. Lord, I lift up the ministries that are getting birth here. I lift up the volunteers. I lift up everybody that has been putting their hand to the plow. Lord, I can't wait to see what you're gonna do the next month. And if I can't see it here on earth, Lord, and you call me home, I will see it from heaven. And I will see your children going forth, knowing that the harvest is out there. But they don't care about the neighbors of you because they are a neighbor. Lord, this is me. Put me to work, Father God. So as we worship you in this song, Lord, this is our opportunity to surrender every most part of us to you, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen.